Well, 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 what do we have here? A new OnePlus flagship, and I feel like we kind of know the story of the OnePlus phone now at this point, right? It's a new one, it's a little better, a little faster, a little more complete than last year. It's also a little bit more expensive, and people really want to know if the camera's actually any good. Same story. Also, real quick before we get into it, this video is sponsored by Skillshare, which I just completed and dropped my first class in, which is pretty cool. I'll get into more of that at the end of this video. So this year, more than ever, as you may have seen from the slow tease of all the specs and features on social media, it looks like maybe OnePlus has finally put it all together. You know, they've always got the high-end specs, but there's a refreshed design and there's a lot of big talk with that new camera system and a collab with Hasselblad. The 9 Pro starts at 969, so creeping up, creeping ever closer to that $1,000 flagship price. Matter of fact, this upgraded version I'm testing is 1069. So it's expensive, but it's also technically undercutting some of the competition at the same time. So this feels like a turning point for OnePlus. They're, they're trying to claw their way into the actual mainstream with this 9 Pro. And they're also dropping a standard OnePlus 9. I have a separate review video of that phone coming up very soon, so keep an eye out for that. I'll drop a link to it in the description below when it's live. But yeah, this is it. This is the 9 Pro that we are waiting for. By the time you're watching this, I've been using this, testing it, taking pictures with it, tweeting from it every day for about three weeks now. So I feel like I can paint a picture of what it's like to own it. And also, I'm gonna spend a healthy amount of energy on this camera situation because it's a pretty important factor here. This new design though, honestly, I think it says a lot both about how OnePlus sees this phone, but also about how we can look at this phone, which is competitive, just a, a little bit more generic than usual. First of all, it's definitely a good looking phone. No doubt about that to me. It's got the thin bezels at the front with the small hole punch. The slightly curved display over the edges is manageable. It's not too bad. You've got thin metal rails all the way around, but I also feel like it's harder to describe anything distinctive about this phone than it has been in previous years. You know, maybe it is the camera bump again. This one is uh, pretty recognizable with two huge circles. It's two layers deep, but it also isn't too crazy, especially if you drop it in a case. You know, the buttons and the alert slider, they're all still pretty nice and clicky and in good spots. They went back to a glossy finish for this specific colorway, which I mean, it's cool that it is a gradient from top to bottom, kind of like the morning mist, and it looks fine when it's clean, but now this is just another glossy, shiny, fingerprinty mirror phone, like so many others now. I'd like to see the other colorways, which are apparently matte. Maybe that would change my mind, but yeah. What do you, why'd you not send me a matte one? That's what I want to know. You know what this reminds me of? This phone, it looks a lot like Galaxy S8. Remember that phone? That was one of the simplest, cleanest, safest, designs in any phone. It's actually a good thing. I think that was a pretty well-liked phone. It also had a headphone jack, but that's that's kind of what this looks like to me. But yeah, the overall shape here, especially the metal rails with the antenna bands all over them, even the newly centered OnePlus logo in the middle of the glossy back, it's all very 2017 vibes. I don't know. Maybe we can just ban mirror-backed phones after a while. Actually, I'm pretty sure channel sponsor Dbrand is perfectly happy to keep selling us better versions of the backs of our phones, like this robot camo. So that's an upgrade in my book. I'll link this one below. So whatever, despite the pretty casual hardware, uh, you do still get IP68 water and dust resistance, which is nice. And you do still get the OnePlus touch, which is that fast and smooth focus. So per usual, that starts up front with a fast and smooth display. And this is one of them. This is a 1440p, 120 Hertz LTPO panel. And this is a nice screen for sure. It gets plenty bright up to 1300 nits. It's HDR10 plus certified, and yes, it can do 1440p and 120 hertz at the same time. But it's worth noting, you have to use either standard 60 hertz or smart 120 hertz, which is going to automatically modulate the refresh rate between one hertz and 120 hertz to save battery, depending on what's happening on the screen. They're calling it Fluid Display 2.0. Normally, these have been pretty great at saving battery, and I typically never notice the moments that they drop to lower refresh rates. And this one combined with OnePlus's Oxygen OS is no exception. It's been pretty good to me, but I did occasionally see stutters and animations. So I, I did look for an option to force 120 Hertz in the developer settings and I couldn't find one. 
Nevertheless, it's sweet having this screen and a 360 hertz touch sample rate, the high resolution, the great colors, the brightness, all that is sweet. But again, I have the same complaint that I had with the Oppo Find X3 Pro, which is why is the fingerprint reader this low? Like this is two phones from the same group now. I have a feeling they're probably both lower on the screen for the same reason because both Oppo and OnePlus kind of work together, but why? Like, what is the reason? I, I think this is a worse fingerprint reader placement. I, I got used to it, but it's worse. It's harder to reach. Just want to put that out there. All right, so let's just get all the specs on the page here real quick. So Snapdragon 888 chip, eight or 12 gigs of fast RAM, 128 or 256 gigs of non-expandable storage. Little light there. Uh, there's a 4,500 milliamp hour battery, which can fast charge up to 65 watt on a wired charger or 50 watt wireless charging. And then there's uh, the quad cameras on the back, which we'll get to in a second. And then overall, just a, a pretty high-end performance profile, pretty competitive, and the performance matches. Every phone I've tested with this chip performs great. And aside from the very occasional frame drops that I noticed, which I imagine could be ironed out with a software update, this is definitely no exception. Really snappy, smooth phone, and Oxygen OS is still one of the cleanest, most well-done implementations of Android. Google integration is strong with the, the feed, and the default dialer and messages and photos. Plenty of other added features are cleanly tucked away in the settings like the always on ambient display and being able to turn a, a long press of the power button into an assistant trigger, but also like, why not let us remap that to anything we want? We'd love to use it for other stuff. And you know what? I gotta give a shout out to the haptics. I feel like anytime a phone has particularly nice haptics, I wanna be sure to call that out. This phone has a nice, High quality vibration motor, again, gives you good, clean, tight vibrations. It's the good stuff. And actually the software really leans into this. So if you drag the volume slider or the brightness slider with your finger, you actually feel a bunch of little clicks as you scroll, kind of like when you scroll with the digital crown on the Apple Watch. So it's a nice touch. Battery life on this phone is pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, so like I mentioned, this is a 4,500 milliamp hour battery, which is a decent sized cell. And I was getting, five hours of screen on time typically. I did kill it a few times in a day. It's not one of those endless marathon batteries, but it was good. My usage is with 5G on and a lot of high brightness, scrolling, email, social media, watching videos, some navigation, that sort of thing. Not a lot of gaming. Uh, and that's pretty good. I'd give that something like an A minus. But of course, if that isn't good enough for you, there's a couple things you can do. First, you can switch down to 1080p, save a little bit of battery that way. Second, is you can switch to 60 hertz mode, which of course it works, but nobody really wants to do that on a phone like this. And of course there are other, you know, emergency battery saving modes. But third, the real solution from them is the fast charging, really fast charging. So 50 watt wireless charging and 65 watt wired charging with the brick that's included in the box. So the way they pull this off is pretty smart, but also Pretty simple. It's a dual cell battery design. So there's two cells in here that charge in parallel and add up to 4,500 milliamp hours total. So with that charger in the box, it's juicing up zero to 100 in literally half an hour, which is incredible. But then there's a wireless charger. That is super impressive. It's an optional accessory, which I, I normally don't spend much time on in reviews, but this one's pretty cool. I mean, you obviously don't see many 50 watt wireless charging phones out there, but this one again is taking advantage of the dual cell design. There's actually two coils inside this charger and each one charges one of the batteries at 25 watts. So they combine for 50 watts of peak wireless charging power, which can go zero to 100 in 43 minutes. That's faster than most other phones wired charging. Now you have to use this exact charger to get that speed. Other wireless chargers won't charge up this phone that fast. And this particular charger will, I guess, max out at 15 watts when charging other things but this is probably the number one best accessory to get for the 9 Pro, so they even gave it a removable cable this year. So it's gonna retail for 70 bucks if you wanna grab that too on top of just the phone, and I feel like that's actually a pretty good deal for that kind of speed. So we'll see what all this fast charging does to your long-term battery health, but that's the trade-off OnePlus has notoriously made, which is the phone will last about a day usually, but you'll be able to quick charge kinda anywhere conveniently. There's like a OnePlus charger for the car. I'll drive to work, plug in for a few minutes, that's enough power for the day. Or I'll charge on my desk for a few minutes. That's good enough for a while. But you know what setup they've been talking about more than anything else in this phone? Over everything, more than the specs, more than the design, more than the fast charging. It's the cameras. 
So let's talk about that. So on the back, there's two huge rings and two small ones, a mic, a laser, and a flash and a Hasselblad logo. So there's a brand new sensor for the main camera, 48 megapixels at f1.8 with OIS. And there's another huge one and that's the ultra wide. And that's another new 50 megapixel sensor with macro capabilities. Then a 3.3X, eight megapixel telephoto and a two megapixel monochrome sensor. I'm just gonna ignore that two megapixel monochrome sensor. So OnePlus has talked a big game about this new camera system. Like if you'd only followed what OnePlus has said, you would see that this looks like a game change. This is gonna be the, the revolutionary new biggest feature in photography is this collab with Hasselblad. It's gonna change the game forever. It's not, but it is a pretty good smartphone camera. Honestly, I think the new sensors are more interesting than the Hasselblad partnership itself. These are huge sensors. And the idea of an ultra wide camera that's every bit as good as the primary camera is awesome to me. The ultra wide in this phone is literally three times the size of the ultra wide in the iPhone 12 Pro Max. That is really interesting. But okay, let's just let's just address what is this Hasselblad OnePlus collab exactly? Is it just them slapping a name on it? Because look, I love myself a Hasselblad camera. I love mine. I love the photos it takes. But I'd argue that historically their name on other things hasn't really meant very much. The last time they did a Hasselblad smartphone collab was a Moto Mod that was one of the worst mobile cameras I've ever used. And I suspect OnePlus didn't have a lot of input there, but on a scale of one to 10 of brand collabs, one being just the B&O speakers in a car, like they just slapped the name on it. 10 being Yeezy and Adidas literally collaborating on a design and a project line, where is this OnePlus Hasselblad collab? Well, if you read into it, OnePlus talks about how they spent, they're spending $150 million on this partnership over three years, and they're gonna be working with Hasselblad ambassadors who will advise them on tuning the camera and the photos to look better. Basically what it all boils down to right now is color tuning. So what does that mean for your photos? So photos from the OnePlus 9 Pro and these new big sensors are pretty good, especially when you give them a lot of light and the images are very sharp, but there's just, there's a lot of details in every shot. And sometimes I think it's a bit over-processed and over-sharpened where it doesn't quite need to be. There's a lot of that big sensor fringing still on close-up subjects. It's a common look at this point, but it's worth noting. But overall, from image capture to processing through the whole pipeline, this is pretty good quality. Now with the Hasselblad collab, they're talking a lot more about more natural colors. And I do sometimes see that. To be honest, most photos still look pretty predictable like a smartphone photo. A nice contrasty, almost pixel-like processing is here, but with slightly muted colors sometimes. Like in this shot with the grass, you can see it's a little muted and even more with warm colors. So like this shot with the orange wall, the wall in real life is slightly more orange than that. And same with this orange on a turf field I worked out at. And then this shot of some fruits in a grocery store with the oranges and yellows and greens, I think this is where you see it the most of all the photos I've taken. And it's fine. It gives you a little more room to play with in editing without looking too flat. The real strength of this system though is definitely, definitely the ultra wide. Uh, I took lots of back-to-back -back shots with the main camera and the ultra wide to check the consistency between the two. And I kept noticing two things. One, the ultra wide is really good and is clearly one of the best in any phone. But two, it's, it's actually typically has better white balance than the main camera. Uh, when the main camera misses, it misses kind of blue. And so some photos will have a cool blue cast to them. Not a huge deal, but the ultra wide didn't really miss like that. And the sensor being so huge means it can give you better photos and videos in low light thanks to all the extra light sensitivity and it does great distortion correction. The ultra wide does have weaker dynamic range though. So you can see HDR kind of try to save it sometimes and it looks a bit unnatural over processed. Other than that, A plus ultra wide. And then the telephoto camera, it's not that great. <laughs> and honestly, it's the least consistent. It's also 3.3X, which is not a huge deal. I mean, we've seen 5X and 10X in some flagships over the past few years, but this is all right. In the viewfinder of the telephoto though, you can actually see the shadows bump up and the colors shift way more than the ultra wide. So it feels like the two main cameras are more in sync with each other in processing and colors and then the afterthought is a telephoto. Honestly, that's fine with me. I don't take a whole ton of zoom photos, but that's probably the next thing they should tune. Also, speaking of that viewfinder, I did find I noticed something 
particularly annoying when shooting fast moving subjects, which is kind of funny because Hasselblads are typically pretty slow cameras. But uh, the shot you think you get is not actually the shot you get. Basically, when you shoot a photo, you get this immediate preview, then it shifts once it quickly processes the actual shot, which feels like it's about a quarter second after you actually press the shutter button. It's very consistently delayed by this same amount every time, which means I had to calibrate my shooting style to it, but it's very annoying because even the preview you get in the corner shows the image you think you got when you tap the shutter, but then it snaps to process the actual photo you got, which is a split second after you tap the shutter. So it's, it's kind of weird. It's, if you have kids or pets, or if you're like me and you, you like snap a photo and immediately put the phone down because it's, it's a secret phone you can't show people yet, I'll, I'll like shoot a photo, I think I got it and I put it away, and then I'll check later and it's a totally blurry photo of like the sidewalk. I think they can fix that with software, but that's, that's a weird quirk. So if my question at the beginning of testing this camera system was, is it really that great? And does this Hasselblad thing really mean anything right now? My answer is, it is a pretty good camera. It's not gonna stand out from the rest. It's competitive, kind of the same way the 8 Pros was in line with other flagships. And the Hasselblad thing kind of boils down to color right now. Now there is room to grow that in the future. With Hasselblad, they've said this is a three-year partnership that they're embarking on. And they did mention in the press release that they would be developing custom hardware between Hasselblad and OnePlus. We'll see what that turns into. And I'd be very curious how much this bleeds over into video too, just because Hasselblad cameras, great for photos, but they really don't do videos. Like if you're on the newest firmware in some Hasselblad cameras, they will shoot video if you really make them, but they're not video cameras. So OnePlus' smartphone videos feel very much unchanged to me, even if it is 8K now. They're decent. So on that scale I mentioned earlier of one to 10, one being a B and O speakers in whatever car company paid to use them, versus 10 being a true collab in my vision, Yeezy, Jordan. This with the, you know, the orange shutter button sort of matching Hasselblad cameras and the thunk of the leaf shutter sound and all the extra stuff they put into the pro mode to look like a Hasselblad camera and the beginnings of the color tuning. I'm gonna give this like a six. Still like about a six with room to grow. Okay, a few bonus things that didn't fit into the rest of the video. This phone does have reverse wireless charging, but it's such a glossy and slippery phone that whenever you try to charge something, it can easily just slide off the back of the phone. It's a little rough, but it works if you need it. Speaker quality is good and plenty loud, and call quality is fine. And then the tilt shift mode that some people were freaking out about in the camera is literally doing exactly what that old Instagram fake bokeh does, which just blurs out everything not in the column, which works sometimes, I guess. So that's it, OnePlus 9 Pro. This phone is competitive because of the Snapdragon 888 chip, and there are phones from 800 to 1200 bucks that all have this chip. This one separates itself because of the fast and smooth focus still. That software, the animations and screen, the charging, and I do appreciate that the Hasselblad partnership does appear to mean something, and it can grow and evolve and change over time. My fingers are crossed that someday this will be a world-class camera in a OnePlus smartphone flagship, and then they'll probably use that to justify an even higher price, but without getting into the weeds on that, I think this is a pretty good phone. But speaking of cameras on phones, that's really all you need to start your own YouTube channel here in 2021. I would know because I just made an entire Skillshare class about it. So Skillshare is an online learning community for creatives where you can find thousands of classes for creative and curious people on all kinds of topics, illustration, design, photography, and now making MKBHD videos. It's funny because I identify as self-taught. Like I, I didn't go to school for the thing that I'm doing now, but it was really fun to lay out all the fundamentals and actually think through and present how I look at making videos making a review, navigating the tech world, all that stuff for the channel. I've gone through other Skillshare classes, like there's one specifically on iPhone filmmaking with Caleb and Niles from Moment, and it's really good. You get to learn from other people who are self-taught on how they've created their fundamentals and how they go about what they do. But yeah, for mine, it's, it's my fundamentals about the top to bottom process of how one of these videos 
gets made. But also, I have no doubt I'm gonna be making some more specific ones in the future. And by the way, Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium online classes so you can stay focused and stay in the stream of your creativity. And it's less than 10 bucks a month with an annual membership. So hey, now that I've made this one my first, here's the deal. So Skillshare was kind enough to sponsor this video and offer the first thousand of you that click the link below a free trial of a premium membership so you can stay in the flow for your creativity. See you over there. That's been it. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.